Well, welcome to today's National Soil Survey webinar. My name is Sean McVeigh, National Training Coordinator for the Soil Science Division and the host for today's webinar, Emergency Watershed Protection Program Implementation in the Caribbean Area. This webinar is being recorded and all participants join the webinar in listen-only mode. You receive the webinar audio through your device's speakers. There is no telephone dial-in. If you are having audio difficulties, please check the various ways your computer speakers may be muted or have their volume set low, including the speaker adjustments available in the Adobe Connect interface. Be sure to turn up the volume if needed. You can maximize your webinar experience in Adobe Connect by shutting down Cisco AnyConnect and any other programs that might compete for bandwidth. This includes email and Microsoft Outlook and instant messaging in Skype. Taking a look at our webinar room layout, Adobe Connect has content pods that include the feature presentation and the Q&A pod. Use the four arrow icon in the featured presentation pod to enter and exit the full screen mode as you choose. To submit a comment or question for me or our presenters, use the Q&A pod and type in your question. We're here to answer your questions. I'll handle technical difficulties the best I can while hosting the webinar and interact with our presenters to answer your questions during the verbal Q&A periods. I want to thank Luis Hernandez for being here to support our webinar and to introduce our presenters for this part of our webinar. I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic and our presenters. Luis. Okay, th thank you, Sean. Um, I'm hi, uh, folks. Uh, this is Luis Hernandez. Uh, I am a soil survey uh, Rio director with the NRCS uh, Soil and Plant uh, Science Division. Um, uh, again, as Sean already indicated, uh, this webinar is about the NRCS Emergency Watershed Protection Program uh, implementation in the Caribbean area. Um, back in calendar year uh, 2017, two major uh, hurricanes impacted the Caribbean area, uh, causing catastrophic damage uh, to the local infrastructure. So things like uh, utilities, uh, communications, access to road, were severe damage. Uh, gas, uh, water, and food availability became an issue right after the storm. Um, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service was one of the first responders uh, from the federal government. Um, the NRCS Emergency Watershed Protection Program was used in the recovery effort to assist local communities with the removal of debris that was deposited in waterways by the storm event. EWP program provided the umbrella uh, uh, for, for, uh, to form a, a very strong partnership among federal, state, and local entities. Uh, this is our story. And uh, before we go into the uh, technical presentation of this webinar, uh, we want to uh, give an opportunity uh, to uh, two NRCS leaders that were instrumental uh, uh, in the implement uh, with the implementation of this program in the Caribbean area. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm just going to uh, ask uh, Edwin Almodovar, who is the uh, 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 NRCS Caribbean Area Director, to say and um, share a few words. So Edwin, please. Thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks, everyone, who's connected on, on this webinar. On behalf of all our Caribbean area employees, thank you for, for sharing your time and thank you for joining. Um, I want to start by thanking Luis uh, and the rest of the team that made this webinar happen. I know that uh, a lot of people were working behind the scenes, but also to the presenters, Eli Martinez and, and Lee Brown. Uh, this group of people that are presenting today are employees that have been with us for, for, for a very long time serving as detailees. Actually, the three of them were part of the original 16 employees that helped uh, perform DSRs. So thank you for helping and providing leadership to our Caribbean area in EWP. And what better way than, than, than hearing you guys presenting this information. But I also want to provide a quick overview uh, and a summary of, of the help we've received. And I know there's going to be more details, but just for everyone's information, you know, days before the hurricane, uh, Irma and Maria, uh, we were in communication with leadership and headquarters with Acting Chief Leonard Jordan and Acting Regional Conservationist uh, Craig Derrickson at the time. And the entire team in NRCS and headquarters made themselves available to provide not just leadership and guidance, but much needed help related to logistics and operations. 
There were many people behind the scenes, and I will fail if I start naming names, but there's a, there, there was just a tremendous amount of help. And uh, they kept asking, you know, Edwin, what do you need? What resources do you need? And one of the things that really came uh, uh, really quick was this group of 16 employees that came from across the country and that were made available to help with damage survey reports. And not just related to EWP, uh, but to the recovery as a whole, uh, we had an overwhelming number of detailees helping us throughout this year and a half after hurricanes. We've had over 60 detailees and we're still counting. And matter of fact, you know, if you're still interested, we have a, a few positions available, especially with EWP, an EWP coordinator and, a e, and an EWP coordinator assistant. So feel free to reach out. Uh, for those of you who have lived uh, catastrophes before, you know, you could relate with what I'm going to describe, but just imagine, you know, going home uh, before a hurricane and, and then you ride out the hurricane and then you wake up in the morning and there's your, your neighborhoods destroyed, you know, there's a lot of people in need, uh, confused and, and, and a lot of uncertainty. So we had a lot of, a lot of successes over this year and a half, uh, but they all came at a price, you know, with uh, 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 handling challenges and struggles. Uh, challenges with communications and accountability in the early phases, but then as we met, kept moving forward, you know, there's lack of the basic necessities to perform our job. It was just, you know, the perfect recipe for help uh, for for failure. But uh, but because of the team that's about to speak to you and the leaders in this call, uh, you know, we we make things happen. And uh, and after the hurricanes, you know, just just keep in mind that NRCS is not a first responder agency. Uh, you know, with the help of detailees, we work tirelessly and, and determined to help our people in the Caribbean area. And uh, the numbers are going to be shared later on, but there was a significant amount of sites that we help uh, clean up. And, uh, and we learned a lot about uh, the program, a lot about not just uh, EWP, but the way that our sponsors were, were working. You know, our, our mission right after the hurricanes, it was uh, helping our, our people recover. And then it transitioned to helping our people become sustainable and, and, and resilient. So with that, you know, I, I really want to thank everyone who's, who's in this call, uh, all the leadership, everyone and every single detailee that has been through our uh, area. And, uh, and thank you for securing over $25 million under, under EQIP and over $30 million under EWP and helping over 2,000 farmers and cleaning up uh, over 300 sites under EWP. So uh, we're very proud of what we're going to present. And uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us, but together, you know, we're making things happen. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Luis. Appreciate it. Okay. Th thank you, Edwin. Um, uh, another NRCS leader that was a uh, very instrumental uh, uh, with implementation of the uh, Main Sea Watershed Protection Program in the Caribbean area was Juan Hernandez. Uh, Juan is the uh, state conservationist in Maine. So Juan, uh, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And as well as what Edwin mentioned, thank everybody to everyone to take the time to call into this webinar. And let me give you the perspective that two reasons why I got closely involved with this. Number one, um, I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, like many of the folks have, have work and help in this process. But number two, I happen to be detailed in national headquarters as a division director for um, financial assistance programs when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. So I happened to be at the right time in the right location so that that became sort of a de facto operational aspect of what was going on. Uh, like Edwin mentioned, Puerto Rico, um, they had a lot of limited supplies and, 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 and necessities, including communication. Puerto Rico was unable to communicate outside the island for a significant amount of time. They were, it's not like they didn't want to, they simply had no means of communication. So in the meantime, um, I became sort of a quasi-director of the island while Edwin became a line when everything became functional to some extent. Little things that nobody thought about it, timesheets and, and supplies and, and things of that nature. So in the meantime, so I met with, with the chief, and I said, so listen, it is already by October 3rd, I remember having a meeting with him, like, we need to do something about uh, the situation. This is going to be very complex. 
And Leonard, at that point, the acting chief said, just just write a proposal. Give me a proposal. And, and the next day, I gave it to him. And I remember that I found my email of what I sent him, and that was October 3rd. By the 4th, I received approval from USDA. It was a whopping one day from the point that we received approval from NRCS and the USDA. And that was really interesting because of the um, – the clearance that I was unaware that we needed to secure the safety of the employees, and it is somebody that do in the department allow uh, employees to travel to disaster areas. I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie into this thing, so all of this happened in less than 24 hours, and they gave us all the allocation. They said simply do what you need to do, assemble the team. And from that point, guys, it was less than 10 days, and we were landing in Puerto Rico. I mean, we were ready. The whole team was in Puerto Rico, 99% um, bilingual, and, and almost everybody from Puerto Rico, which is remarkable. All that I had to do is pick up the phone, call them, and they were online ready to go. Uh, so that, that's what we could really call it rapid response team because it was really – an immediate response from the point that it was created to the point that they were deployed. Uh, I know that they were going to share with you later the, the DSRs. We divided it in four teams, and, and the key of what I will call the success was that they were multidisciplinary. They were not, uh, we had a sole scientist, we have an engineer, we have a sole conservationist. That allowed every team to be um, independent and had different uh, jobs and responsibilities so that that allowed us to function independent. And that allowed us to divide the island into functional areas. And, and you will see later on a map of how the team divided. Uh, before I uh, let go of the floor, I wanted to thank uh, Luis Diaz and, and Silmari Padron. Uh, they're both employees from Puerto Rico. They play a huge role into the logistics. They, they were our local eyes and ears and everything. They manage the fleet. They manage uh, availability of drinking water. I mean, I can go on and on into how critical they were into when we landed in Puerto Rico, a lot of these logistics were already taken care of. Uh, so two things I need to take home. Number one, as an agency, we really, really need to learn uh, to work into creating a response team that is on, on, on queue so that they are trained and these folks are willing and able to travel. I think that that is a key component that a lot of people are willing to do this, but they did not have the training uh, or understanding uh, of all the in and outs of a DSR and the programs and whatnot. Having a POC communicating from the perspective of the EWP and FEMA, that became very, very cumbersome and very convoluted very quickly. And, and last but not least is, is now communicating and having a, a person at least with a business center, with the FPAC business center now, it will be critical to maintain all these administrative challenges moving forward. But with that, I wanted to yield the floor back to uh, Luis Hernandez. And thanks for having me and have a great day. Oh, thank you, Juan. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, you can see the uh, webinar outline. Uh, this is all the information that we're going to share with you. Uh, we're going to have four speakers. Uh, I just want to uh, briefly introduce each of them. Uh, we're going to have Edwin Martinez, uh, who is a natural resources specialist with NRCS in NHQ. Uh, we're going to have uh, Lee Brown, who is a civil engineer with NRCS in Wyoming. Uh, we're going to have Kiwi Harris, who is a state hydraulic engineer in Arkansas. Um, Mr. Harris is uh, right now the, e, uh, the uh, EWP uh, Caribbean coordinator. Um, he's, look, he's in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, last but not least, uh, you're going to hear from me uh, uh, during the uh, webinar, too. So uh, the Caribbean area. I just want to make sure that you guys understand when we talk about the NRCS Caribbean area, what we're talking about. So this map is showing the NRCS Caribbean area. So as you can see, the largest island of this uh, of the Caribbean area is Puerto Rico. And then uh, there's a, uh, about five islands, uh, Culebra, Vieques, uh, on the east side of Puerto Rico. Those are municipalities of Puerto Rico. 
And then you keep going this, uh, you see the uh, U.S. Virgin Island, uh, St. Thomas, uh, St. John, and St. Croix. West of Puerto Rico, they are two tiny islands. You can see the one uh, with the name Mona on the top. Those are islands that belong to uh, Puerto Rico, but no people live there. This, this, uh, in this geographic area, the, the NRCS Caribbean area, uh, we, uh, the area has about 3.5 million people that live uh, throughout the islands, okay? I just want to show you uh, this uh, terrain map of the uh, Caribbean area. Um, the main point I want to get across is, if you can see, those islands are not flat. Those islands have mountains. Yes, there are some uh, flat areas, especially on the coastal areas, and that is what we call the coastal plains, but for the most part, those islands have mountains, okay? I just want to share with you some information about rainfall uh, on the normal conditions. So this, uh, this map is showing the mean annual rainfall for the Caribbean area uh, from 1981 to uh, 2010. Uh, as you can see, uh, most, most of the rainfall stays at the mountains or on the north side of the island. The southern portion of the island, I'm back in Puerto Rico now, is a little bit drier. Uh, as you can see, uh, well, uh, that is happening because there's a chain of mountains that run east, west, or west east that keep most of the uh, rainfall, again, at the mountains uh, or on the north side of the mountain. U.S. Virgin Island, you can see uh, that they are fairly, you know, they, they dry, uh, just like the uh, southern portion of Puerto Rico. In regard to soils, uh, I guess that this map shows the soil orders that occur in the Caribbean area. Uh, uh, in the U.S. soil taxonomy uh, system, uh, recognize 12 orders. Uh, in the Caribbean area, uh, you're going to find 10 of those. So the diversity of soil is very high, and that is related to the soil formation factors and the, uh, and the geology of the area. Uh, I, this, this map shows the land use. I have it only for Puerto Rico, but uh, I, I want that, that you, uh, that, you know, uh, please notice that there are pockets of, of towns uh, throughout the entire island. Uh, most of the farming takes place on the mountains and on the coastal zone where the landscape is a little bit flatter. Okay, these two maps, the one on the left is the hydrography of Puerto Rico. The one on the right, uh, maybe you don't, cannot see it uh, well, but it shows, this is the, 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 it shows the, the amount of roads that, that, that you find in Puerto Rico. Again, I have these uh, two maps only for Puerto Rico. Uh, the point that I put in these two maps, again, the hydrography, you can see small island, but a lot of water. <laughs> a lot of water bodies uh, throughout the entire island. And then the roads, uh, the map on the right shows the road. There are roads everywhere, and people live everywhere throughout the islands. So the reason why I'm showing this map is because when we went uh, to do uh, this work, uh, to do the site assessment right about three weeks after the hurricane, the picture, the picture on the left side shows what we found. Uh, Okay, so uh, you see a road, and then it's a bridge, and then what happened in, for, for the most part of the site that we, uh, that we visited uh, was that the event brought a lot of debris that clogged the corridor, and the water didn't have any other place to go, so it flooded all the houses that were on the, on the back, and then 
at some point, the water went over the bridge and caused a lot of uh, bank erosion. Um, in, in, in many cases, destroyed the bridge. The bridge collapsed and became debris. So I guess uh, how all of this happened, uh, we're going to give the floor to uh, Lee Brown, who is going to talk about Hurricane Irma and Maria. So Lee, please. Thank you, Luis. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just like Luis said at the beginning of this presentation, my name is Ali Brown. I am a civil engineer in Casper, Wyoming, and I had the opportunity to complete two details in Puerto Rico right after Hurricane Maria. And now I'm going to talk about a little bit um, dates and impact. Um, just to follow a chronological order and a lineal timeline of these two hurricanes, uh, we're going to start with Hurricane Irma. Uh, Hurricane Irma passed through the northern uh, of the U.S. Virgin Islands on September 6, 2017, as a Category 5 storm with uh, winds in excess of 185 miles per hour. A uh, significant storm surge um, occurred on the U.S. Virgin Islands, especially St. Uh, Thomas and St. Uh, John's. Uh, the National Ocean Service um, tight gauge uh, wind of, of line during the storm and di didn't uh, record any um, peak water level. Uh, one day after, on September 7, the eye of the hurricane then passed 50 nautical miles north of San Juan, Puerto Rico. The highest wind speed reported in Puerto Rico was 55 uh, miles per hour, with a um, gust of uh, 74 miles per hour. Um, Puerto Rico rainfall uh, range from 10 inches to 15 inches over high elevation in the center of the island between September 5 to September uh, 7. Uh, maximum flood levels uh, we have of, um, of two to uh, one to two feet uh, along the Puerto Rico uh, coast. Um, this image is showing you the Hurricane Irma path on the Atlantic Ocean and then the, Cari the, the, the Caribbean Sea from August 30 to September 10 when it hit um, Florida. Um, continue with, the, with Hurricane Maria on September 20th, 2017, just 12 days after the Hurricane Irma, the center of the Hurricane Maria passed 25 miles south of St. Croix, uh, one of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, the peak intensity for this hurricane was 173 miles per hour, and the pressure was uh, 908 millibars. Maria was a Category 5 storm with uh, 160 miles per hour winds and uh, 917 millibar pressure when it hit um, Vieques at 4 in the morning on September 20th. And just like, just like Luis said at the beginning of this presentation, Vieques is one of the islands in the east, east part of Puerto Rico. Uh, Maria's eye made landfall on Puerto Rico, the main island, southeast coast um, on September 20th as a Karagori four storm with maximum winds of uh, 500 of, of uh, 155 miles per hour. Um, when I say hurricane, when I say high category four storm, um, what I'm saying is like Maria was just two miles um, just to be a category five. To be a category five has to be equal or greater than 157 uh, miles per hour. And Maria was 155 miles per hour. Uh, Maria crossed Puerto Rico from southeast to northeast, uh, emerging into the Atlantic Ocean uh, eight hours later with winds of uh, 110 uh, miles per hour. 
the total storm duration was approximately 20 hours. Uh, Puerto Rico experienced uh, storm, storm surge from six to nine feet uh, on the east, northeast part of the island. Um, the rainfall totals um, from 15 inches to 38 inches across um, the island with massive flooring and landslides. Uh, just, just a historical fact here, uh, Maria has been the most devastating tropical cyclone to impact Puerto Rico since 1928 when Hurricane San Felipe hit the island. Uh, in this image, um, I'm showing you um, the Hurricane Maria over Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, also, you can appreciate how large and vast this hurricane was uh, dimension-wise, um, pretty much covered all these islands in, 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 one, um, in one period of time. So continue talking about the winds and pressure of Hurricane Maria, and this is a very interesting um, fact. Um, Maria's 98 miles per hour intensity increase over 24 hours on September 18 uh, was the sixth fastest intensifying hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, basically, Maria went from 86 miles per hour to 167 miles per hour in just 24 hours. So in other words, from category five, one to category five in just one day. Um, Maria's minimum central pressure was 908 millibars. This is the lowest pressure on record of any hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean. And this is a very interesting fact. Mar hurricane Maria's pressure broke the record that has just been set a couple of weeks earlier by Hurricane Maria of 914 millibars of pressure. Um, here uh, you can see uh, that table that I took from the NOAA report. Here I'm showing you that in, uh, increase in intensity of Hurricane Maria. You can see on September 18, Maria went from 75 to 145 um, knots on uh, wind speed and then reaching a maximum of um, 173 miles per hour on September 20. That image that you uh, can see on your, le on your left, um, this image is from the San Juan Doppler radar. Uh, this is the Puerto Rico uh, National Radar, uh, just before the Hurricane Maria landfall in Puerto Rico. As a matter of fact, this was the last image from that radar just before it was destroyed by the hurricane. And uh, this happened with many weather instruments uh, with um, not only in Puerto Rico, but also in the U.S. Virgin Islands, many weather instruments that we use to collect uh, weather data were destroyed. So uh, many of this um, valuable information was destroyed and we couldn't um, record that information. Um, these two tables uh, show you the stats of these two hurricanes. Uh, Maria ranked number 10 at the most intensive um, Atlantic hurricanes. And then on your right, you can see that um, these two hurricanes, top three and, um, and five, um, these two hurricanes, three and five, that has caused the most property damage um, and money wise. So now we're going to talk about damage and conditions after uh, these two hurricanes. Uh, and just like I did before, I'm going to follow uh, the timeline and we're going to start with uh, Hurricane Irma. Um, San Thomas and San Jones two of the U.S. Virgin Islands suffered widespread catastrophic damage, and the islands were um, stripped of the most of their vegetation. The entire electric grid collapsed, along with communication uh, networks. 
and numerous homes, businesses, and fire and police stations collapsed. The hospitals on each island experienced severe damage. Uh, San Croix, um, the, the damage in San Croix was not severe, but power outages lasting over two weeks. Uh, Culebra, um, another island on the east side of Puerto Rico, experienced near total power or, and water loss. Many homes in Culebra were destroyed or suffered major damage. Um, Irma's eye passed north of Puerto Rico, lashing the island with tropical storm force winds and heavy rains. Uh, weak structures on Puerto Rico collapsed and numerous trees were uprooted. There was also an, a, a near total loss of electricity and water supply for several days. Um, the NOAA estimates um, damages in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands due to this hurricane at approximately $53 billion. Um, the, the damage caused by Hurricane Maria and the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, especially in San Croix, was directly impacted by the, um, by the uh, Maria's um, north um, eye. And the island's only hospital was severely damaged, as were many schools and the electric grid again, and communication network collapsed once again. Um, about 70% of the island's homes and structures were damaged, including widespread roof damage and complete destruction of many wooden houses. In St. Thomas and St. Jones, the other two islands of the U.S. Virgin Islands, most of the roof, signs, and trees uh, had already been destroyed or damaged 12 days early by Hurricane Irma, but large rainfall accumulations generated flooding and mudslides across all of these islands. Um, the impact of this storm were exacerbated by over a month with heavy rains after, after, uh, afterwards. Um, excessive rainfall generated significant flooding and mudslides across the island. Um, island the island-wide curfews were established for weeks after both storms. These curfews were to maintain, were established to maintain the safety of the population of these islands because there was no communication and because there was no power or electricity. The NOAA estimates damages in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands due to this Hurricane Maria at approximately $19 billion. So continuing with the um, damage caused by Hurricane Maria, but now in Puerto Rico, um, at this point we can say that Puerto Rico was devastated by Maria's winds and floods. Over 200,000 households of 1.2 million were totally or partially destroyed. In some communities, 80 to 90 percent of the homes were severely damaged. Um, Marinas and harbors were, civilly, were major damage by high wave and current associated with storm surge. The storm surge also caused significant damage over the northwestern coast area of the island. Maria's combined destructive power of storm surge and wave action produced in, uh, extensive damage to buildings, homes, and roads along the east and the south. Um, southeast um, coast as well. The rivers overflowing were unprecedented, especially in the north part of the island. Um, hundreds of families had to be rescued from the rooftops in the northeast part of Puerto Rico. Maria knocked down 80% of Puerto Rico's utility poles and all transmission lines, plunging the island's 3.4 million residents into a complete darkness. This blackout and no communication lasted for a long time. In some locations, uh, there was no power for over a year. The same with potable water and running water. Some locations didn't have potable water and running water for um, a long time. Um, a very interesting fact is that Puerto Ricans and people outside the island 
couldn't communicate with the with the people inside the island. So that was um, that was very stressful. Um, people outside the island were trying to send supplies, but the the mail service was not working. People couldn't get medications. Um, couldn't get ice for the coolers. People were in never-ending lines for days at the gas station um, to get gas for vehicles and power generators. Um, because the communication issues, people couldn't withdraw money from the bank, and some grocery stores were empty and couldn't get any supplies. And that's just um, just some of the issues or uh, difficulties that people had after uh, the hurricane hit the uh, the Caribbean and the and the Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, just to show you some pictures of the damages uh, caused by Hurricane Irma in the U.S. Virgin Islands, this is what you saw everywhere every day: uh, um, houses completely destroyed without the roof, and businesses, you know, uh, destroyed um, by the uh, you know caused by by the winds and the and the floods of, of this hurricane. Um, another example of, and, and this time I'm showing you uh, Hurricane Maria um, pictures here, especially in Puerto Rico. Uh, some of these pictures were taken by me, and this is just what you saw every day, everywhere. Um, houses completely gone in some um, locations without the roof. Um, on, the, on the left top corner, you can see a baseball field with major structure, uh, structural damage. And down below, you can see houses completely flooded. And in, in some cases, the entire community was gone. Um, agriculture, um, Maria caused major damage to agriculture across uh, the region. It wiped out 80% of Puerto Rico crop value, uh, causing losses of um, $780 million. Uh, just to mention some crops that, uh, that, that Hurricane Maria damaged, plantain, banana, and coffee uh, were uh, very uh, damaged. Um, poultry industry was also a major damage. Um, the poultry industry lost 90% of its production and about 2.2 million of uh, its 2.6 million birds, and that's just in September. Um, the dairy industry also um, was severely damaged. Hurricane Maria injured or killed about 4,200 cows and caused over 2 million in losses in the Virgin Islands as well. Maria caused uh, major damage and devastation on the farms, crops, and facilities. And here are some pictures of that. Um, storm surge, the combined effect of the, storm, the, the surge and the tide produced maximum flood levels of six to nine feet above um, ground level. And here you can see that um, these two pictures were taken on the west side of the island. And in some pictures, you could see the water debris as high as six feet, you know, um, in, in some fences. Um, you can see that debris after uh, the water backed down. Um, rainfall and flooding. This map is from the NOAA. And it's, um, it's a Hurricane Maria estimated rainfall. And you can see that the heavy rainfall in Puerto Rico reached a total of almost 40 inches in some locations. And that happened in just uh, 48 hours. Here's, um, here's a map from the USGS showing you um, landslides all over Puerto Rico, especially in the mountain range of the central part of the island. And these two pictures I showed you those last slide. You can see these everywhere uh, in the central mountain part of, um, of the Puerto Rico uh, mountain range in the central part of the island. You can see landslide um, and, and you can see roads completely gone by this landslide. And this is just an example of you can see, you can see this everywhere. 
And with that, I will um, turn this presentation over to Luis Hernandez. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lee. So as, uh, as Juan Hernandez uh, indicated, uh, uh, plans uh, uh, to respond to the emergency uh, from USDA and RCS uh, uh, took place uh, early uh, in the process. Uh, a group of about 15 NRC specialists uh, uh, from the lower 48 uh, were detailed uh, to help out with the emergency in the Caribbean area. Uh, the group uh, consists of a good mix, uh, multidiscipline approach, uh, soy, soy conservationists, soy scientists, engineers, and other disciplines. Uh, this group uh, join the uh, local NRCS Caribbean area uh, employees and um, was uh, charged to complete the, uh, the EWP uh, disaster, disaster survey report. Okay, so as, as one, one uh, indicated, uh, we took the island, um, we divided in four, uh, I guess, pieces uh, we uh, the uh, the uh, and you can see on the map on this map the uh, the uh, geographic distribution and the towns that were assigned to each of the groups um, the uh, okay so uh, each of the team, uh, were, again, it w w uh, went out and, and they were responsible for completing uh, the DSRs. Uh, you can see the team on the south uh, was responsible uh, for completing the site assessment in the U.S. Virgin Island. So uh, again, as soon as the, uh, the uh, teams uh, arrived to the sites, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, they were responsible for completing the uh, the uh, the disaster survey report along with other uh, I guess uh, doc uh, documentation like the location map, the site plan and sketches, uh, cost estimates, the CPA 52, the gun chart, soil analysis and site pictures. Each of the team consisted of a soil conservationist soy scientists, engineers, and representation from the local municipality, and a representative uh, from the Department of Natural Resources, the state natural resources in Puerto Rico. Uh, the four team visited above 1,000 sites, but only about 440 qualified for the uh, EWP program. So this map here is showing the uh, distribution of the sites throughout Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. After we have all the sites, we have too many of those. So uh, in order to prioritize the projects, uh, we develop a global rank ranking uh, system uh, we use uh, some factors that are the heart of it, the, the program. Um, and this program, uh, again, the EWP program, uh, 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 the, the, the key is that there has to be site wording of life, property. Uh, you have to show high, the highest benefit, and you have to be cost effective. So we took uh, these factors, we assigned a, a, a weighting system, we plugged the information, uh, in, um, um, entered that stuff in the computer, and boom, uh, the computer gave us the priority order uh, for all the projects. And then when you have all of that information, you have the DSRs, you have all, all the documentation, uh, we got the money, then we go to the EOP implementation phase, and Edwin Martinez is going to cover that section. Edwin, please. Thank you, Luis, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Edwin Martinez. I'm a natural resource specialist working in Washington, D.C., responsible of the Great Lake Restoration Initiative. 
uh, I was blessed to have the opportunity to work in the Caribbean area for over seven months, right after the storm and then during the implementation phase. Uh, to define the initiative that we were able to use uh, to address this uh, emergency in Puerto Rico, uh, the Emergency Watership Protection Program was created by Congress to respond to emergencies caused by natural disasters. Some good examples will be when you think about the fires in California, the flood uh, in Texas that recently happened, uh, the hurricane that hit uh, Louisiana and other states. So, so those are some of the examples. Primary to relieve immediate uh, hazard to life of property, uh, all projects undertaken under EWP must be sponsored. That's something really unique when we offer our technical and financial assistance with uh, programs. The yeah, EWP, we need to have a sponsor. A sponsor has to be a subdivision of the state. That could be a city, a county, uh, a flood control district, or a conservation district. The primary implementation mechanism of EWP is via agreement and federal contracts. We will not go into a lot of the details, uh, specific uh, technicalities on agreements and federal contracts, but those are the two main mechanisms that were used. There are two types of assistance uh, available via EWP. Exigency, which is also known as urgent and compelling, and this is work that needs to be done immediately. Once we access the site, we have up to 10 days to complete the work. The second type is emergency or non-exigency. In these situations, they still uh, a threat to life and property. However, in, it's not considered urgent and compelling. We have more time to work on this. Even though this is not urgent work, we have to keep in mind that exigency, the emergency work that we do is the one that has the highest impact. We have from start to end up to 220 days to complete the work. In this case, we can do practice that are more structural. We will be talking about that next. So EWP work is not limited exclusively to any set of prescribed measures. This is determined by the state conservationist on each individual location, by the magnitude of the event, the type of event, and the funds available. The example practices that you will see here are specific for the Caribbean area. Uh, in this case, you can see that for the exigency work, we did debris removal, vegetative and non-vegetative, and then for non-exigency, we were focusing our resources in stream bank stabilization. So some of those practices are debris removal, gabions, seeding and mulching, channel and reshaping, bioengineering. You can see some examples in here of some of those practices that were completed. Uh, just for as an, as an example, a set of gabions, and then also you can see one of the sites that were actually addressed in Puerto Rico. We have not done any non-exigency work at this time, but a lot of the debris removal was completed, and you will see more illustrations in a little bit. This is the time frame for what the event that happened in the Caribbean area from where the hurricane events happened back in September 2017 all the way to when the cost, the 100% cost share was going to expire. Um, you can see at the beginning of the presentation, of the slide, hurricane impact, that's basically when the events happen. Then we have the funding justification, that's what Juan Carlos mentioned and Luis Hernandez mentioned earlier, that uh, we secure the funding, and then we have the funding implementation. Basically, we, we, we time frame everything to try to address all the sites to be able to utilize the 100% cost share, starting from July approximately all the way to December. We were targeting that 100% cost share because you may know about the financial situation in the Caribbean area, primarily in Puerto Rico. So it would have been really, really challenging for them to be able to do a 25-75 cost share as other programs that we manage. Uh, detail is assistance. This is really important, and I know Edwin Almodovar, Juan Carlos, and Luis Hernandez all mentioned 
the importance of this critical task. You know, detailees were coming from all over the country to assist during the assessment uh, uh, time all the way to the implementation phase. And in these pictures, you might see some of the local detailees that assisted, uh, local staff and detailees that assisted with EWP, but also they assisted with equip emergency in the local area. In addition to the technical experts, soil cons, uh, soil scientists, engineers, biologists, contract, contracting officers, grants and agreement specialists, and farm bill program specialists, uh, we also have some state conservationists that got together and assisted right after the emergency. Juan Carlos, uh, Hernandez, Astrid Martinez, obviously Edwin Almodovar, Carlos Suarez, uh, and some regional staff like Luis, Luis Hernandez and national staff like myself here for an HQ. Uh, the Caribbean team, local assistance was really critical. They were going through all of these situations at that time. However, they were able to assist and continue to work to do the EWP implementation. So the combination of the detailees assistance along with the locals was the success to be able to do the EWP implementation in the Caribbean area. As Edwin Almodovar uh, mentioned earlier, our national team provided leadership and support continuously to be able to get the detailees from the states all the way to Puerto Rico for X amount of dates. The cooperation between state conservationists and the national office was significant to be able to make this a success. Planner operation procedures, this is something that is really critical because we were able to successfully put together some documents for everybody who was working in the Caribbean area ongoing. Those detailees were there for 30, 60 days and went back home and so on. So we need to have something that will allow us to be consistent, that will have quality control, that will be efficient and effective for knowledge transfer between those detailees and that will allow us to keep the initiative moving forward. So these are some examples of those uh, standard operating procedures that we put together. A sponsor step-by-step -step to successfully secure EWP agreements. Every single step that a sponsor needed to do to secure an agreement was there. And we will sit with them and explain every single step of the way. A step for or to effectively develop EWP agreements that was for us internally any detailee that had not experienced with EWP will show up. They should be able to follow these steps and actually su successfully secure an agreement. And then payment documentation, as you may know, this, this money is emergency money. It's money that the president has to allocate for the emergency, obviously Congress have to allocate. And it's really critical that any payment, any, any cent that we spend uh, on EWP that is well documented. So these type of checklists allow us to do so. This is an example of the agenda that we will actually execute when we're meeting with uh, EWP sponsors or potential sponsors. We will meet with uh, FEMA and other agencies, and we will go over all the logistics on EWP from explaining them, the damage survey reports, the DSRs, uh, packets, what was required, cost estimates, permits, cultural resources, material disposals, payments, et cetera. Many of us who came to Puerto Rico to assist were not familiarized with the local laws for disposal of materials and how some of those things were managed. So we needed to learn as it goes. But having this type of uh, agenda allows us to visit every town or municipality, which Puerto Rico has 78 different ones and 78 different mayors that we needed to talk to. So it make it a little bit complex in addition to the ones in the Virgin Islands. This is just to show you the organizational process that we had internally. This is a few agreements from 200 to 212. This is how we had our agreement filing system. And then here, you can see one specific agreement. We're looking at 205, that agreement, what it takes to have from that folder to all the information that need to be contained there to be able to meet uh, any specifics, uh, audits, et cetera. These are folders within that folder that contain all that information, from project certification, pre-agreement, cultural resources, close-out information, payments, DSRs, et cetera. Every single agreement had this information. One example here will be the pre-award. The pre-award document concludes this file. When we think about EWP, the complexity of doing the implementation of the program, 
and, and how the sponsor could understand the program better, you can see that here, if we have a lot of forms for other uh, financial assistance programs that we deliver, take a look at this. We have about over 17 forms that we needed to fill out per specific site for agreements. So you can imagine the sponsor going through all of this information and getting familiarized with those uh, with that information to successfully secure an agreement. One of the checklists that I mentioned earlier, this is the one for uh, reimbursement. So basically tell the sponsor what type of agreement they're asking for funding, uh, what is expected for them before they request funding, you know, what type of pro work needed to be done, uh, what documents they have to have on file, and also what, were, what documents were required. Going back to audits and, and money coming from, uh, from the nation for this emergency, every single penny that we spent, we needed to make sure that we justified for audit purposes. So all of that information needed to be there, including really detailed information about staffers, et cetera, because there's multiple type of agreements that are being done via EWP, locally led force account or federal contract. Everything was made this way so we could actually distinguish between those and have the proper information there. And obviously for practices that are required, which exigency did not require, an operation and maintenance plan that was written in there for their reference. Now we're going to go back to Luis Hernandez, who's going to be talking about partnership and collaboration efforts. Oh, th thank you, Edwin. Um, I'm just going to say this. Uh, NRCS alone uh, could not uh, implement this program uh, in the Caribbean area. So this PowerPoint, uh, this PowerPoint slide is showing some of the key players that were extremely uh, uh, important uh, and helpful to, uh, with the uh, implementation of the emergency watershed protection program uh, in the Caribbean area. Um, The, uh, I guess Edwin and others mentioned the major the sponsors. Um, and this is just a, the list of the major sponsors uh, in the Caribbean area. Uh, uh, we have the Southern Water Conservation District, the Suroeste Southern Water Conservation District, the Caribbean Southern Water Conservation District. Uh, we have municipalities. Uh, we have the Puerto Rico uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, the U, uh, U.S. Virgin Island Department of Public Works. Those were the uh, major sponsors that got agreements, cooperative agreements with NRCS for the implementation of EWP in the Caribbean area. Just to share some of the many meetings uh, that we had with partners and uh, potential sponsors. Uh, uh, for the implementation of uh, emergency watershed protection program. Uh, we, we, uh, we were getting requests every day from everywhere that you can imagine. So communication uh, was uh, very critical. So we had weekly meetings with the uh, U.S. Virgin Island Commission of Public Works uh, with Nelson Pettit. Uh, we have meeting uh, with FEMA, uh, with the uh, Puerto Rico Department of Natural Resources. Uh, some of those meetings uh, were like, weekly, bi-weekly. Uh, we had informational meetings with uh, uh, NGOs that were interested in becoming a sponsor. Um, um, again, we have, we use media, website, newsletter, uh, just to keep everybody informed of, of, of the uh, implementation of uh, EWP in the Caribbean area. We use the local uh, local papers. Uh, this PowerPoint slide is showing just a few of the articles that were published in the major uh, papers of the uh, of Caribbean area. Uh, and again, uh, uh, we use the uh, NRCS Caribbean area website, the uh, public affairs section um, in the Caribbean area did an outstanding job uh, publishing information and keeping everybody uh, informed of, of, the, uh, of the program. Uh, they use social media. Um, on this PowerPoint, you can see some of the articles that were published either on the website um, or social media. 
Um, with that, I just want to uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Horris. Uh, he's going to show information about uh, progress and current status. So, uh, Mr. Horris, please. Well, good evening. Uh, so good evening, everybody. My name is QB Harris. I am the uh, hydraulic engineer in the Little Rock State Office in Arkansas, and currently I am the uh, acting EWP program coordinator located in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I'm going to give up a little progress and status report of uh, all the EWP work that's been going on in the Caribbean area. As Luis and Edwin mentioned before, um, there were thousands of sites that were visited during uh, this process. And out of those thousands of sites, uh, the Caribbean area identified at least 439 sites that qualified as uh, exigency sites, which means something needed to be done and work needed to be uh, completed right away. Out of those 439 exigency sites, most important is that over 11,759 pop uh, people or the population is going to be impacted by these sites. Also, 12,229 uh, properties going to be in impacted in the appropriate benefit it's going to be over $158 million. Also identified currently is 237 emergency or non existency sites. These are still urgent sites, but at this time, the Caribbean area is working on the exigency sites, getting them completed before it starts on the emergency sites. Money for the uh, emergency sites are over $22.9 million. A little accomplishment with the EWP team from the initial team to all the detailees over the past year that's been coming down to the Caribbean area. As of um, January, over 309 exigency projects have been completed with the cooperation of over uh, 56 municipalities. That's including the three uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, St. Thomas, St. Croix, and uh, St. John. But most important also, is that from these completed sites, 5,776 people at risk were saved, and also 5,854 properties at risk were saved, with still uh, more sites to complete. This graph uh, chart is just a breakdown, uh, I think uh, we mentioned before about some of our major sponsors, just a breakdown of uh, out of the 439 sites, uh, how many was completed by many of our major sponsors, including uh, the Puerto Rico Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. We had many municipalities that did multiple uh, projects, including the municipalities of uh, Hajuya, uh, Gurabo, and Balamon, including uh, the uh, Caribe Soil and Water Conservation District, which was a huge sponsor, and also the Soro ST soil and water conservation district, along with the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Public Works for the three uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. Now, out of that 309 sites that were completed, only 184 were completed under EWP uh, agreements. Another 125 were completed also by many of our major sponsors. These sites were so severe that um, the sponsor had to get, you know, the sponsor had to get to them right away. So they was completed by the municipalities, uh, by uh, DNER and many of our uh, soil and water conservation districts, which brings the total of completed sites to 309. And at this present moment, the Caribbean area still has 130 pending exigency sites that uh, needs to be completed. The bottom graph is just the agreements from uh, each and all EWP, we have force accounts, locally led accounts, and federal contracts. And it just breaks it down about, breaks down the 184 NRCS agreements of which uh, agreement type was done. Force account is the least account because uh, many of the municipalities and the sponsors down in the Caribbean area uh, have limited resources to really uh, do most of the work with their own forces. So as you can see, uh, federal contract and locally led was the two major contracts. Also a status of just uh, funding for the exigency projects right now. As I uh, mentioned earlier, over 
$30.1 million were allocated uh, for the 439 exigency projects. At present time of January, and uh, this is still changing, but uh, we have committed over $10.3 million so far in total allocation, which still leaves us a balance of $19.8 million. Most of this goes to financial and technical assistance. And you can see uh, technical assistance allocation was over $4.1 million, with uh, $1.3 million obligated, which still leaves a balance of roughly 2.8 million. Financial assistance, which is construction, uh, you can kind of estimate it to 26 million. Obligated, uh, 8.9 million. We still leaves us a balance of uh, 16.9 million. Like I said before, 125 projects was done, uh, not on an EWP agreement, because they had to be done right away, and there was uh, half of this, so that still leaves us plenty of money for numerous other projects that we still need to get done in the Caribbean area. The next slide just lists um, current projects, or pending projects that are still ongoing. Uh, as mentioned before, the 309 projects that are completed was done on 100% cost share, which that ended December 10, 2018. Now, because uh, the Caribbean area is still considered a um, limited resource area that's been expanded to the whole area. 90%, 10% cost share funding has been um, implemented for the area for December the 11th to March the 10th, 2019. We still have 130 exigency projects that still needed to be uh, completed, and we're hoping to uh, get those done under the 90-10 cost share. As you can see, um, we have more municipalities which are willing to still be sponsors along with uh, DNER, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Public Works. Out of that uh, 130 exigencies, we also have 237 emergency projects that we have identified, 118 as string bank stabilization projects, which will include Brock Riff Raff Almond, the banks, or Gabion, along as 67 debris removal sites. We have 52 sites that are still pending, which is why earlier in the slide, that 237 number will probably change. Again, you a little also progress of what's been done. Uh, these pictures so show before, during, and after uh, projects. This is the um, Savant Gunt on the U.S. Virgin Island of St. Thomas. This was done by our sponsor, uh, the Department of Public Works on the U.S. The US Virgin Islands. This was near Charlotte, Amali. This site of nearly 400 feet of debris removal was uh, removed in this channel. This is an urban channel. It saved uh, the local road, uh, those businesses along this creek, and also homes. The picture on the left also is a picture of uh, Kawamo, Puerto Rico, and this was sponsored by the Puerto Rican Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. This site uh, saved the bus cover. It also uh, saved the local road and homes along the road. It was debris removal. The site on the right was done by the, uh, done by the uh, Caribe uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. They were the sponsor. This is in, this is in Juana Diaz, uh, Puerto Rico. Also, debris removal, this is a bridge structure that was saved um, and cleared out the uh, creek due to heavy debris removal. And this final picture is a site that was done in Mocha, Puerto Rico, near the uh, Culebrinas River. The sponsor for this site was also the uh, DNER. This is a heavy debris removal um, area that you can see the storm just put a lot of debris in the river and this needs to be cleaned out. This site was completed in uh, June of this year, 2018, with over 16,000 cubic yards of accumulated sediment and debris removed out of the river. And these are just a few pictures and a little update of what's been going on in the Caribbean area. And again, I'd like to thank all the detailees 
that have come down to help out and the future ones that hopefully will come down and help out. And now I will turn it back over to Elwin Martinez. Thank you, QB. And um, the next topic is challenges. As you may know, the list of challenges was really extensive. We actually uh, cut it down a little bit just to be able to present some of them. But uh, one of the biggest challenges was completing the site assessments for the damage survey reports right after the storm. You heard a little bit about the conditions. You saw some of the pictures that Lee presented that showed the conditions. Those were the really challenging conditions to be able to complete those uh, site assessments. We were able to successfully complete over 440 and visit over 1,000 sites. But keep in mind, 78 towns and the conditions that we actually uh, had that were a really big challenge. Limited staff, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the team members from Puerto Rico, including some of the engineers and others, were assisting us even though they were going through the emergency. So we have 16 team members to do the site assessments around the entire island, but we also got <clears throat> assistance from the locals um, that were really critical. Limited communication, no cell phone signal, no internet. Uh, as I mentioned, the locals were dealing with their own emergency uh, and assisting their families. Road conditions were really poor, a lot of bridges. Imagine a bridge that is 45 feet, 60 feet tall and was completely washed out. Now you need to take an alternative route to get to point A uh, from point B. So a lot of landslides, and you saw some of those pictures earlier from, from Lee. And then the limited knowledge that the locals had, including the sponsors, about EWP. So it was basically teaching them about the program, gaining their confidence, and, and then for, for them to feel comfortable with the program and understanding all of those uh, things and details. Also, it's critical to know uh, some of the delays that happen for us to be able to secure agreements, even though when we receive the money uh, to be able to execute agreements. We have the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act called PROMESA, which actually imposed some restrictions against the entire island uh, based on their financial situations, financial crisis that is going on in Puerto Rico is the other uh, challenge that we faced. Not everybody wanted to commit to do use the little bit of resources that they had to do an agreement and execute the work when they have limited resources and when this is a reversible program that we will pay after the work is completed. Limited time to educate those potential sponsors because of magnitude and because of how many towns and the U.S. Virgin Islands that we needed to visit and, and meet with, with them one-on-one. -on -one. And then obviously the implementation uh, during the rain season. You saw a picture or a map earlier that shows a, uh, hydrology and hydrography of Puerto Rico. You see all the mountains, you see how many veins of rivers are going through the island, and that was really challenging. Anytime in some locations that we even target and fixed, we get more rain and they were the, the streams, the culverts got already clocked up again uh, just because of heavy rain. Uh, some of the recommendations, and goes back to having a really short list to be able to present to you during this webinar, but it's a really extensive list. Uh, are the following, you know, to establish a EWP rapid response team that we can deploy at any time from the national office or from somewhere within the nation to be able to assist people who are knowledgeable about the program, that can train others right away, that can just address the response, the emergency response immediately. Uh, to develop and deliver formal training course, because even EWP, we offer technical and financial assistance, the way we, we manage EWP working with the sponsors and, and doing locally led force account and federal contracts is completely different. You have to have more knowledge in the grants and agreements and financial assistance division, even though you might be assistant as a soil conservationist, soil scientist, et cetera. Uh, explore opportunities for EWP training session for potential sponsors, just in a way that they can we can keep them informed of this is an opportunity that we have that either the president or the secretary or the state conservation is call, can call at a specific emergency and these funds could be used to address an emergency. Uh, 
develop a work plan for detailees. Tons of detailees were coming back and forth to the island, to the Caribbean area. So having a plan and also an exit report for them to transfer that information or those accomplishments to the next person coming to assist. And then create a, a, a ranking system. Luis mentioned briefly there in the ranking system that we use, the complexity, how many projects we had, 440, how will you rank number one to number 400? So you have to have a really efficient and effective and clear uh, ranking process for everybody to be able to, for us to be able to use and rank you know, for number one to number 400. And if we are ever questioned why we selected that project versus the other one, we can use all of those, uh, you know, the ranking tool system to address that question. That includes uh, hydrological factors and GIS, uh, especially, especially for non-exigency projects. I think those are the only recommendations that we came up to be able to share with during the webinar. Now I, I'm going to turn it back to Luis Hernandez, who's going to continue with the presentation. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Edwin. Um, I'm, um, I guess that the next, uh, I, think, I think that we are ready for the, uh, for the question session. So, uh, Sean, I, sent, I give you the floor so you can manage the uh, questions from the audience. Sure, Luis. And just to remind everybody that uh, put in your question to the Q&A pod there, and we'll take those as we come up. So to get things started, I have a question or two for the panel. And uh, I noticed that you had mentioned a recommendation for EWP training, both for sponsors and for employees. And has, has there been anything happen with that? And uh, who are you working with to, to develop that training? So uh, I, I, um, my initial remarks, I mentioned something about training. Do you make, are you talking to me, uh, Sean, Juan Hernandez? Yeah, just, just a question. Has anything been, has anything uh, been developed for that training yet, or uh, is it still in kind of the idea phase? And, and yeah, at this point, it's a concept, Sean. At this point, it is uh, a recommendation from from a lot of lessons learned through the process that I went through. So I think that is that in order to to be responsive and, and, and granted that we're not first responders, and I do recognize that, um, but having uh, access to knowledgeable folks, uh, being able to hit the ground running, understanding the the, the DSR requirements, I think that is that is critical for the agency. And, and having folks that if they are part of this quote unquote response team, that they are willing and able to travel in a relatively short notice. So I think that logistically that is something that it can be led from, from national headquarters um, because typically the state that has the need is the one that has the least capacity to meet their own needs. And going back to your question, uh, the Caribbean director, Edwin Almodovar, met with the national office and also presented some of these recommendations, including that training. So where it is right now, at what stages, I'm not certain right now, but I know that it was presented also to leadership at the national office. Yeah, hey, Edwin Martinez, thanks for stepping up. This is Edwin uh, Almodovar. just want to add some of those, uh, to those comments. We did uh, brought it up to headquarters, and actually one of the uh, follow-ups was that we target this as an FPAC, as a team. And uh, there were some discussions at the FPAC level. And, uh, and of course, because of the lapse of funds, you know, everything has been on stall. But uh, uh, we are, we are uh, uh, bringing it up to, to, to leadership's attention. Uh, and, uh, and there was a few, there's a few recommendations as far as bringing the training down to the field levels. Um, especially in the, in, the, in the states where we are more vulnerable to these uh, disasters. And also uh, early in the, or, or late in, in the year, uh, the calendar year last year, Luis Hernandez brought uh, the, uh, the idea of, of, of tackling, you know, SWAT teams within the regions, which it was also discussed with the regional conservationists. Uh, we've had some uh, a few uh, transitions of regional cons in our area and our southeast area. And now that James Tillman is coming on board, you know we're, we're bringing him up to speed with uh, the needs that we have, and uh, and hopefully that will be discussed uh, uh, shortly. But thank you, uh, Edwin Martinez and, and Juan, for bringing those up and, and sharing those uh, thoughts. Thanks, Sean, for the question. 
We do have some online questions now. Matt asks, what role did the soil scientists play on the teams? Okay, I think I can take care of that question. Uh, this is Luis Hernandez. So I am a soil scientist, um, and I was a team leader. I was leading a team uh, during the site assessment. But in each of the team, we had one soil scientist. So the soil scientist role was uh, to in each of the site, collect soil samples, do some basic analysis like texture, uh, pH, some basic information. Um, um, and that was the main thing for the, for the soil scientists. In addition to that, the soil scientists, uh, uh, all of them, uh, possess uh, GIS uh, skills. So they were helping uh, with, uh, with the development of maps, uh, location of the sites, uh, and that type of things. So they, 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 they uh, play a very important role in the whole process. All right, and David asks, how is cost effectiveness measured? Uh, this is Lee Brown. I think I can I can take that one. Um, as part of the DSR, um, we have a uh, site evaluation. Uh, we have um, um, the environmental uh, condition. We have um, the um, we have a cost, um, you know, evaluation also. So at the end, what we did, we, we came up with the ratio um, benefit, you know, over over cost using using uh, those um, property damage cost, using um, you know like bridge damage, how much debris we have to remove. So at the end, at the end, we have that ratio between benefit and um, and cost. And that's how we came up with the cost-effective, um, you know, numbers. And I'll, I'll just ask another question. So I can imagine that there was a, perhaps a shortage of a, equipment to do this kind of work. And was it uh, an issue for the sponsors to help find contractors with the equipment to do the work? Did equipment have to be brought to Puerto Rico to do the work? Um, can, can one of you speak to that? Either I can take that question or Evan on whatever may would like to do it either way. Okay, so yeah, that was a, a big, that's a great question and that was a really big challenge that we faced because the amount of damage that the island got and the amount of contractors was really limited. Uh, obviously, including having some of these limited small companies or contractors doing work already that in locations that were targeted as critical by the municipalities, so their equipment that was limited was already compromised with other type of work. So we we faced that uh, challenge. So our contracting officers work with us, and and they have the ability to look at how many contractors are within the island, and they were able to split. These contractors are in the north, south, east, west, and they have the ability to travel around the entire island or just work on this specific region or location. And they also look at contractors within the mainland that have the capacity to bring equipment to Puerto Rico to, and the Virgin Islands to be able to get the work done. But that was one really big challenge because some of the, when we were doing the bids for the federal contracts and some of these companies or locals wanted to do a certain amount of work, they may not have the capacity. So we need to reach out to others to be able to get the, the work done, thinking about the, the rain season and all the challenges that came uh, around that. So it was really challenging, and it's definitely a good question because that was, that was a big discussion that we had internally within NRCS, also with the Puerto Rico Department and other resources because they have limited equipment and they may not have, have it well maintained maintain main it. So there was all of those factors uh, that work needed to be done. We didn't have enough equipment uh, or trained people to do it. And in addition to that, Edna Martinez, this is Edna and Moldova, uh, we also had the challenges that all the equipment in the island was being uh, uh, sequestered by FEMA or handled by the Army Corps or anyone else that had uh, a priority. Uh, so by the time that we we settled into moving forward with the 
with the with the federal contracting process, you know, most of these agencies and departments were already ahead of us in in securing contractors, and there was a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work, uh, not just for debris removal, but also for uh, you know highways and clearing roads and moving debris from uh, you know uh, a uh, uh, the, the the locations where the debris was to uh, local local landfills and things like that. So. The, the workload was monumental, and uh, the available uh, uh, the resources was was scarce. But it was a, it's, it's it's a good question. All right, and another online question. Resac asks, how did you come up with the population impacted numbers, and uh, how is the approximate benefit calculated? Well, uh, uh, this is Luis Hernandez, and I'm going to take care of the first question. Um, uh, we estimated the impacted population where, when we were conducting the DSRs. So uh, we, when we arrived to the site, uh, we, we, when some of us went and count the, uh, the houses and the, uh, uh, how many people were impacted, in addition to that, uh, as I said in, uh, initially, uh, we had a local rep from the municipality. So this, this person, uh, you know, it's, it's a local person that knows the entire municipality, and they help us to, uh, to estimate uh, the numbers. Can you repeat the second question, please? Sure. It was... Um how is the approximate benefit calculated? So the first part was how do you come up with the population impacted numbers and then how is the approximate benefit calculated? Okay. Um, we, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, these are, um, that's a very local, you know, uh, number. You know, so so I mean, you, you have to refer the local people who will tell you, um, you know, those values. But basically, the benefit will depend on, you know, how how many properties, how many houses, you know, how many bridges uh, will going to be damaged, you know. Um, if we do not, uh, you know, release the debris or clean the debris or remove the debris. Um, so, yeah, it's directly um, directly proportional of how many properties, you know, uh, we're going to save with this implementation. And, and, again, those numbers, those values, you know, the figures that we, we, that, that we use were um, local numbers, you know. I mean, it, it's a very localized, you know, um, question. So it, it will depend of uh, of the state. You know, it will depend of the local prices. It will the local value. So, but again, benefit it's directly proportional to the property um, that uh, that that will be impacted. You know, uh, if we do not remove that debris or if we do not implement uh, the practice. Uh, this is this is Edwin Almodovar. Um, if the question is is in line with the cost, uh, the cost was uh, with the, the cost list that was used was the FEMA uh, prices that uh, were shared. Uh, we we provided uh, the local sponsor, the Department of Natural Resources, an opportunity to bring up uh, the local cost, but that of course that that didn't happen because uh, of the challenges that they were having. So we used the FEMA-based cost. I don't know if anyone on the line could. Uh, expand on that, but I remember us using that because of the uh, lack of response from the local government. Yeah, this is uh, Lee Brown again. Yeah, we use the FEMA uh, base, cost, base cost for the engineering cost estimate that, that we, uh, we prepare uh, for each site individually. So we use those costs um, for, uh, for the engineering cost estimate. And, 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 you know, we have to come up with a uh, with the um, templates, you know, of those costumes, you know, we have different, different, um, different, um, different items in those um, cost estimates. Um, and again, we use we use the engineering cost estimate and the uh, benefit 
um, to come up with the with the ratio at the end. And uh, this is Juan Hernandez. And basically, when we were conducting the DSRs, things that we at least took in consideration were um, access to business. We had um, impacts to being the only access to a significant population of folks. Uh, we, we asked and interviewed either the municipal person with us or we stop people. More than once we saw ourselves like flagging people like, hey, we, we got to know what the scope here, like how many people need this bridge and how many people access. And so we did to the best of our abilities, collect as much information so that we could de determine these cost-benefit analysis that we were required to do. All and right. The FEMA uh, and the and the clarification, the FEMA numbers, they are basically a start as a base, and they are adjusted by the Department of Labor from the location that they are subject to work with. And they are adjusted by availability, like Edwin Almodovar was mentioned, like pressures on, on, on availability of equipment. A lot of these things come to the picture when FEMA develops this payment schedule, for lack of better terms. Back to you. All right. Steph asks online, uh, one of your last recommendations was to develop a ranking system with a variety of factors. Who is that directed to? Is it directed to states or sponsors or EWP staff? That will be, I can take that question. That recommendation was to the national office and not to the national EWP coordinator. Obviously, we have something standard that everybody could use with certain factors, and they can adjust as it goes. It would be really helpful because when you're on site, there's some information that will be, it doesn't matter what type of event may happen, flood, fire, et cetera, there are some factors that you can actually use. Uh, so something standard that the states could actually uh, utilize for the implementation uh, of the, the program, you know, to the coordination of priorities. It may have different, different factors at the end of the day, but uh, like what we came up with for the Caribbean, we, we, we came up with a ratio system to be able to rank all of those different factors using the benefit, the cost, how many houses, how many hospitals, et cetera, were saved. And I see that there's another quick question in there in terms of uh, how we manage debris disposal. Uh, that There's local regulations for debris disposal in Puerto Rico. FEMA opened several uh, disposal locations uh, around the island. And we were just following, a, you know, the sponsor needed to follow the local restrictions and regulations to be able to securely dispose any material, vegetative or if it was sediments or rocks, et cetera. So they were following the local uh, regulations that were established by the Puerto Rico government. And there is a, a short piece at the end of that. You, maybe you could speak to it just, and where did, where, so where did it all go? Where did all that debris go for the most part? Was it to existing landfills or what? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Okay. I can speak on this one, but it will be also good. Uh, Edwin Almodovar feedback because he has the local knowledge, but there was do, different uh, disposal locations, and there were different, obviously, restrictions for the soils, for the, the vegetation, et cetera. So it was all disposed into one location for FEMA to be able to quantify that uh, volume. And then they disposed the specific materials following the Puerto Rico Department of Natural Resources and Environmental. But I know they may have done some different things because I know some, some of the wood was recycled, et cetera. So Edwin, if you could speak on that, uh, that would be good. Yeah, I know someone else uh, wanted to speak, but uh, from, our, from my end, uh, there were some farms established to uh, dispose of the uh, processed uh, 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 wood debris, uh, and, and it was used for composting. Uh, some private organizations or nonprofit organizations were also handling that. There was a lot of things that uh, that were done, uh, uh, but specifically, you know, trying to trying to uh, uh, create the composting materials, the carbon. Uh, it was it was it was disposed most of it like that. Um, I don't know if somebody else that wanted to chime in, uh, Luis Hernandez, perhaps, or someone who was here locally. Yeah, yeah. The the only the, the only thought I have about that question is that that when we when 
when when the uh, contract were were developed, uh, it was required uh, to the contractor uh, to specify where they are going uh, to dispose the debris. Um, 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 and by local regulations, the only sites where the contractor uh, can dispose the debris was on approved and authorized uh, disposal sites like uh, municipality landfills. All right. Well, we said has exhausted all of our questions online, so I'll turn it back to you for some closing remarks. Okay, uh, uh, th thank you, Sean, again. Uh, I, I guess that uh, uh, this is work in progress, as Mr. Harris indicated. Uh, they're still going. They have many, many sites uh, uh, to complete, uh, exigency sites, and they also have many, many sites, uh, emergency sites that they need to complete. Uh, I want to thank, uh, well, we want to thank uh, USDA and NRCS for the continued support from the very beginning of this effort. Uh, the NRCS has state conservationists um, and directors uh, uh, for the continued support and loaning uh, uh, NRCS uh, specialists uh, to help out with the uh, with their emergency. Uh, we want to thank the speakers. Uh, we also want to recognize the EWP partners as sponsor in Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Island. Without you, we will never get uh, uh, implement uh, EWP in the Caribbean area. Uh, I guess that you heard some of the guys talking about two, uh, two, two things, contracting and agreements. So uh, the NRCS contracting section, thank you, Lori, I, uh, in Syracuse, and the other, other people that were engaged, and then the grants and agreement uh, uh, section. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, they, they were very instrumental, keeping us uh, in the right track during uh, the, uh, the uh, development of agreements um, and the contracting phase. Uh, the folks at uh, NSQ, uh, Nora, Kevin, uh, Sean Anderson, thank you for your uh, uh, help and guidance. I, I guess that uh, the uh, e EWP, what I call EWP leadership, uh, Carlos Suarez, uh, who was at one point the, uh, appointed by the USDA uh, secretary as the USDA lead uh, for, the, uh, for the recovery efforts in the Caribbean, so Carlos, thank you. Juan Carlos Hernandez, Edwin Almodóvar. Uh, another person that was very instrumental is the state conservationist in Wyoming, Astrid Martinez. Uh, thank you, Astrid. The EWP detailees, I mean, I mean, they, they, this, will, this uh, group, I mean, they were the one who get all the hard work uh, completed. The NRCS Caribbean, uh, area uh, employees. Uh, I mean, they embraced us when we arrived. Um, they were with us. Um, thank you. Thank you for your help. So in summary, uh, we hope that the information uh, that we just discussed in this webinar, uh, we help people help the land by saving lives and properties during the, uh, I guess, uh, federal uh, government response to natural disasters. So with that, I send it back to you, Sean. All right. Well, since we're thanking, I'm going to thank all of our panel for your time and effort to make this presentation, and thanks to all the participants for joining in. We had well over 160 people join today's webinar. The, I hope you found the information beneficial, and the on-demand recording for this webinar will be available on our National Soil Service Center YouTube channel within a few business days, so feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. And this concludes our webinar presentation. Thank you.